that's the only thing I can All right. Especially as they have the impetus. Aloisi. Jay Hill. Jay Hill! Listening to FNR Football Nation Radio. Ever wanted a career in football? At the Global Institute of Sport, you can now study a master's degree in football business or football coaching and analysis right here in Australia. GIS is the largest provider of sports degrees in the UK with campuses at Wembley and Etihad Stadium. Learn online with unique access to the iconic MCG and a big hitting Australian industry network. Be one of the first Australians to get a football master's degree and join GIS's global network of football leaders. Apply now to start in February 2023. Learn more at gis.sport slash fnr. That's gis.sport slash fnr. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR. Time for another episode of uh, Sufin or State of Our Football Nation. Uh, Lockie Flanagan is running the controls, George Stanikian in the other chair, and we have a couple of special guests to, to join Indeed us in just do. a moment. Uh, one of them, a young guy making his way in the sport, formerly of Sydney FC, now at the Western Sydney Wanderers. We'll catch up with him in just a moment. And by the way, tonight's uh, program, State of Our Football Nation, is proudly brought to you by GIS, the Global Institute of Sport. I want to know a bit more about it. It's tremendous that uh, the game has come and came on in, sorry, the game has come on in leaps and bounds um, and the borders now are uh, global. So, you know, here it is. It's a tremendous opportunity mm. to and advance spe- yourself if you wish, yeah, if you and, have and a desire. Specialised opportunities. I Correct. mean, I got the, the ad from JS just on my own personal platform a few days ago and yeah. they were offering... I think it was a, a master's in football coaching and analysis, and you can have the whole thing done in a week. How fantastic. Um, you also get to, I don't know if you know, online classes if you choose to do your yep. master's, but yep. if you're doing it in Melbourne, yep. uh, doing a 2023 start, you also have the occasional class at the MCG. Thank you very much. Uh, over in the UK, there's uh, Wembley, you do classes you know at Old Trafford. You're wetting my appetite. Maybe you could do a master's <laughs> no, in no, football I'm, coaching and analysis, oh, yes, George. Yes, sure. Yeah. I think I'll leave it to for you young guys and uh, uh, there are young women who are looking to make a name for themselves in the in the game and why wouldn't they yes there's a women's world cup Absolutely. inside was it nine months now yeah i think it's eight oh. yeah eight nine eight All nine about that. yeah but if uh, if it's of interest to you gis.sport slash fnr okay. is the place G-I-S, to go to yes that's the learn brand. a bit more you okay. can start in uh, january 2023 speaking of uh, finding out a bit more let's find out uh, about our special guest uh, uh, all the way uh, from Sydney, I think he's in the western parts of Sydney, um, via Zoom, it's Callum Neuenhoff. Callum, welcome. Hey guys, good to be on the show. How's it going? Uh, listen, where did your football journey first start? Take, um, us, wa- take well, us back. Take us way back. <laughs> take us way back to the start. Yeah. Uh, I guess it started for me long ago, probably from my dad, you know, introducing me to the ball. I started when I was really young, um, when I was just a little toddler, and I started playing from about the age of five for my local team in the Northern Beaches, which is Curl Curl. And from Curl then, Curl guess, Boy. Yeah. Okay, all right. North yeah. North Shore. Uh, for the Victorians, it, it it means little, but if you're a New South yeah, Wales George person... Knows, George yeah, yeah. knows what it means. Uh, yeah. North Shore people, yeah, yeah. I'm an Eastern Suburbs boy, uh, Callum, uh, and we, we used to look at the North Shore and go, yeah, right. <laughs> So take us back to Curl Curl. Dad's, you're about five. Dad's got you uh, at the local club? Yeah. Um, from then, you know, yeah, I fell in love with the sport. I always used to go, I'd always be kicking my dad and my younger brother. And from there, I guess I went into the Manly United uh, SAP system from under 10s, under 11s. And then Fantastic. played there for a few years. Uh, from there, I moved to the FNSW Institute, which is the Football New South Wales Institute at the time. 
I was there for the last year and then that shut down and split off into the two academies where Western Sydney Wanderers and Sydney FC academies sort of sprang up. So um, I moved to Sydney FC Academy for a year and then after a year I actually took a, a bit of a step back and came back to Manly United uh, and played there until about under 18s, under 20s and then moved back to Sydney FC where I yeah, started playing more and ended up getting a bit of a run in the first team. I started training with the first team and um, eventually made my debut in late 2020 in the Asian Champions League in Qatar. Do you know, uh, reflecting on that journey of yours, I'm, I'm reminded of how similar it is in many ways to young Marco Tilio, who started uh, in, in at uh, Sydney FC and, uh, of course, found his way to Melbourne City. And, of course, he's gone on, he's played for uh, Australia. Um, you uh, have had a bit of a setback. You, an injury knocked your uh, aspirations uh, well and truly for quite some time. Um, what actually happened? Can you take us back to that? And how long is it taking you to, to get over the, the physical um, uh, handicap that, that you have to sort of go through before you can get through the journey and come out the other end? Yeah, injuries have definitely impacted my progression a lot. Um, I mean, yeah, I had such a um, great start when I started off with Sydney FC and I played about, I think, 13 or 14 games with them um, before I was getting like lower back pains and basically I was training through it and to the point where it became a bit unbearable and ended up, I got a few scans. I think they didn't actually find exactly what it was until like the fourth or fifth scan and it was a stress fracture in my lower back. So that, yeah, that's um, not a great injury to have and it set me out for quite a few months. So yeah, that was my first real year in the A-League and it sort of came to a grinding halt, which was obviously really disappointing for me. Let me let me and just then, let me just yeah. pause you there for a moment because uh, your back injury now is uh, mended. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The back. Uh, I want to give you the great. That that is fantastic news. Uh, the reason I'm I'm pausing there is because I want to take you to a moment in sports history in Australia. Uh, our, one of our greatest fast bowlers in the Australian cricket team was a guy called Dennis Lilly, and uh, you may or may not know the story, but he broke his back. And um, uh, people were saying that's the end of a great career, that's the end of a great talent. And he went along a special program, uh, and we're talking a long, long time ago now. He reinvented his style, in other words, his delivery, and took the, the big strain that was causing the problems out of it. And he came back and became an even better fast bowler for Australia and had a fantastic career and, of course, has entered the the realm of legend. So the point I'm trying to make to you is uh, every setback uh, makes us uh, reassess what we do, but um, it, it's fascinating if you have the fire, if you have the energy and if you have uh, that real passion. Uh, all those setbacks just make you better because you come back and you, 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 you change little things uh, so that you don't go and hurt yourself again. Have you have you had good people around you? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, all the at both the clubs have been at um, Sydney FC and now Wanderers. The like support uh, staff that's been around me, this from the physios, the S and C coaches, everything has been yeah incredible, and I can't um, fault them at all. And I think yeah, in relation to what you were saying, definitely having that injury, it, yeah, it's only made me hungrier really. And now that I am back fit. Um, I feel like, yeah, I've been a lot more thorough with, you know, everything I do and I'm a lot more mindful of keeping myself in the best shape so that I can continue playing and hopefully stay injury free for as long as possible because obviously if, if you're not playing and, yeah, you're not really achieving anything. I mean, are you, are you a Pilates? Out the park. They got you doing Pilates for the core strength? Um, not, not, not explicitly Pilates, but very, like, similar. Like, yeah, a lot of core, like, foundational strength to, yeah, like, really strengthen that um, that area. I mean, I imagine the the hunger to get back playing, it wouldn't have just been a, a byproduct of the injury being away from football, but also because of how well that time at Sydney, you know, did start when you cracked oh, into the Alex set. I mean, I, I still think quite often, and it comes up well on that rock that you
uh, debut, or is is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I was on my um. Oh well, yeah, that was, that was my A League debut. And Ooh. yeah, that, was, that seems like it's so long ago now. Was, <laughs> I think another time, another A-League world. Seasons. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> But um, to be honest, I, I don't really think about it too much. I think of, yeah, I had my moment and now I'm just really working hard. And now I'm, yeah, focused on a lot of different things. Like now I'm at a, at a new club and I'm really pushing to keep playing at this club and do the best for the Wanderers. So, yeah, that's really all that's been on my mind at the moment. You've got a, a former Sydney FC uh, superstar who's come across with you. How, how's he finding uh, the the new terrain and living in Sydney's western suburbs? No, yeah, 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 yeah. How you how are you guys no, finding it? Um, yeah, we're, we're both loving. It. I think we've both settled in really well. It helps a lot because of the massive rebuild that has gone on at the club. Um, like the vast majority of all the players are new, so I think that's really. Yeah, helps. There's a lot of new faces and everyone's settled in really well. I think Nick Ninko is such a massive asset to have at any club. I mean, he like he obviously provides on the pitch. He's still classy as ever. And also off the pitch, all the work he does with all the young boys keeps everyone motivated. And yeah, he really adds to that winning mentality. So I think we're both settled in really well and we're yeah looking forward to the rest of the season. You talk about, Callum, the level of turnover for, for Western Sydney in the off-season, the amount of new faces. I think there was, uh, of the starting 11 that played in the, the win against Perth, just two of them who had previously been at the, the club the previous season, the rest of the other faces like yourself. How has the, the gelling process been, you know, in this, um, in this off-season leading up to the A-League season? Because it, it's enough of a battle for one player to come in and how they're going to go, how they find their feet. But for a, a dozen to do it, it I'm, I'm curious to, to know a bit more about the process. Yeah, I think it's honestly been a, a lot easier and like a lot more seamless than, yeah, you might think. I think Mark um, Rudin, the head coach, obviously with the players that he has brought in. I mean, all the, all, all the way from the older foreign players down to the um, younger players that haven't even de- debuted yet. Everyone's just so hungry and everyone has that same desire to really create um, a winning team. So I think, yeah, the gelling hasn't been too hard. Everyone's been working really hard and we, we've all got the same goals and we all want to fight for each other and do the best for the club. So, um, yeah, I think it's been really easy and seamless, actually, the, how the team's come together. Uh, you speak of your your time in the game, and uh, we talk about Manly, we talk about Sydney FC, and now Western Sydney Wanderers. Your coaches in those three different clubs, who were they at Manly? Um, well, when I was at Manly, actually, quite funny. My coach was Adam Griffiths, who's now the assistant at the Wanderers. So, so right. He, um, in other words, he knew he knew what he was buying or knew what they were reaching out for to get. Yeah, 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 he would have had some idea. Um, and then at Sydney, uh, I was playing under Bimby, under Steve Corica, and Rob Stan was the assistant. Yep. And now at Wanderers, obviously, Mark Root and the yep. coach. So how different are they in, and in, in temperament and also in how they are using you? Um, I think, yeah, obviously they've got different coaching styles, um, Steve and... Mark, I think, to be honest, I think I'm only just beginning to see the start of um, Mark's coaching and all his tactics and everything. I mean, we've just started the season and I'm sure a lot's going to change over the course of the season and, yeah, I'll learn a lot more about his coaching style. And But he's made it, yeah, extremely clear what he wants and expects from all the players, all our roles and responsibilities. So in that sense, he's been very... Um, yeah, very strict and forward and we, we all know what we need to do to obviously yeah do our role in the team uh with steve it was it was definitely the same yeah like everyone knew exactly what was expected of them and everything i guess i also played a different role like when i was at sydney i was more of a younger boy and i was wasn't playing much and i was really just learning from a lot of the older boys but i think now in this new environment i'm really trying to um push to yeah, get um, myself a starting spot and to stay in the squad week in, week out. State of our Football Nation on FNR, Callum 
Newenhoff uh, from the Western Sydney Wanderers is our special guest and uh, we're taking him through um, what we normally do. It's called our Thursday grilling, uh, giving him a chance to, to also give us an idea of his career and his, uh, his path to the game. Um, just uh, taking us back to, um, to, to Manly and, of course, the step up to Sydney and, of course, the step across to the Western Sydney Wanderers, um, you've, you'd be very aware of just how different the game is and, and the pace of the game, the tactics and, of course, uh, the, the people you play with. How easy is it today to make that transition from the NPL clubs and others and make your way higher into the elite uh, parts of the game that make up the A-League? Uh, that's a good question. I think, obviously, yeah, I think there is a really big step up in terms of the NPL um, yeah, moving from the NPL to the A League. I mean, one thing that has been really interesting to see is all the NPL clubs doing extraordinarily well in the FFA Cup or the Australia Cup recently, like Sydney United making the finals and um, a bunch of other NPL clubs, yeah, making the quarters and semis. I think there's so many, yeah, young players out there in the NPL that definitely have the potential and the talent to move up into the A League. I think a lot of it is just mentality. Like, mm. if you really want to make that next um, step up and you really are willing to work for it. I think there's a lot of players in the NPL that would definitely be willing to. I think, yeah, all it takes is that extra bit of dedication and like real focus on getting yourself in the best shape and trying to learn more about the game so that, yeah, you can get an opportunity in an, an A-League club. You hear a lot of the EPL coaches talking about suffering. Players need to suffer. Do you understand that mentality? Um, in, in more context, though. In the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sense, for example, Antonio Conte uh, wants to wants a squad that, that is going to work hard for him and, you, and, and they play a particular game where uh, the, they have to uh, uh, be very contained and very alert to what the, uh, the opposition is doing. So there's got to be a lot of you don't play with the ball but you, you're playing in a certain system that allows you, when the opportunity uh, presents itself, to attack. So he's saying to them, they've got to suffer. They've got to play outside what is their normal game until they're good to go or the opportunity presents itself and then they've got to spring like a lion forward and attack. D do you understand or are you getting to understand now the difference between, say, playing, as you said, in, at, at Manly and making that transition to the A-Leagues and finding out that, as you just touched on, it's a mental game. It's a mental game more than a physical game, even though you've got to be a, a, a physical specimen and, yeah. and fit to play the game at the best level. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's actually, yeah, something that Mark, our um, head coach, really drives into us is a yeah, like concept of suffering. We've been working on it a fair bit recently, actually, but I guess, yeah, it all comes down to the fact that it's a nine-minute game and you're not going to have possession of the ball for... Um, all the game, never ever. Obviously, there's going to be moments where the <laughs> other team's packing you, and you have to sit back and dig deep and yeah, suffer. So that's hard. That, that's something that yeah, actually, probably pretty new to me. Like I hadn't really heard of it um, in that way before. But yeah, Mark's really smashing this home with all the boys at the moment. That there's going to be moments this year where we need to suffer, and I think we've got the right boys in the team <laughs> that can do that. Take us back to those early days. Who were your heroes? Who are the people that you uh, got, that, that excited you uh, and made you want to play the the game? And is there anyone you've modelled yourself around? Um, uh, there wouldn't be people that I've modelled myself around, but hundred percent. Like growing up, I've always loved watching all the big name players, um, like Iniesta and. Yeah, other central midfielders like Kevin De Bruyne and players like that. Well, yeah, I guess one other player that I really look up to um, would be Aaron Moyes just because he's Australian and I think he's yeah, achieved so well. Obviously, he went from the A-League to playing the Championship to the Premier League and he's had such a successful career. And I was actually, yeah, really lucky that I got to play against him in my debut in the Asian Champions League because yeah, he was playing for Shanghai. So that, that was really awesome to see him standing across the field for me, but... Yeah, plays like that I really look up to and that's why I'd be like. 
So I, I take it from that answer, Callum, that, that central midfield has, has always been the, the ambition, always been the choice. There was the driver, never a, the there was never a moment in the, the junior career where you're <laughs> moonlit as a, as a striker or nah. a right back or something. It's always been a central midfield? Yeah, yeah. I've always been pretty stock standard, just running around in circles in the middle of the park. What is it about that position specifically that you, you like more than more than others? Because I imagine at the, the very, you know, Hard work. outset <laughs> of your if you're playing days, you'd experience, you'd taste a bit of everything. But what is it about central midfield that mm. uh, you find so uniquely uh, enjoyable and engaging? Yeah, it's probably, yeah, obviously there's the hard work aspect. I love the fact that you know you can defend and attack you can be a box to box midfield you can do it all essentially i've got um yeah a decent engine so i like running around and trying to get on the ball and you know make things happen so yeah that's probably the biggest aspect for me is that i can attack and defend and yeah help out my team in the most ways uh the a-league season is underway mate what did you make of the opening week um, I think, yeah, it was, it was really interesting to see the opening week and all the results. I think, yeah, so many of the teams will be really exciting to watch this year. With Obviously, we have Melbourne Victory on Saturday and players like Nanny coming to the league just, yeah, it's massive and it creates a massive buzz and really, um, yeah, amps up the atmosphere. So I think uh, – with our first game of the season, we were obviously super happy to get the three points. At the end of the day, that was what we really wanted. I think we've got um, so much more room that we can improve, like with the players we have. And I know that that's what we want to do, is to step up multiple levels throughout the season. So, yeah, that's what we're focusing on doing. When do you find out who's in the team and who's not in the team each week? Is it is it tonight? Is it uh, tomorrow? Or, or is it Saturday? Or do you already know? Um, no, yeah, no, we won't find out who's on the mass test squad until the day before or so. So okay. we're traveling up to Melbourne tomorrow. So all, all the boys will have to pack their gear and get ready to <laughs> fly up. Although they won't all make it. Mm. Are you a good traveler, Callum? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm all right. I don't have any issues. I fall asleep pretty easily. and but. That's a gift. You know that, don't you? Never, never lose that gift, the, the ability to, to sleep almost anywhere, in an airport, on, on a couch, on, on a coach, and, um, and hopefully it, it, it allows you to uh, wake up and uh, when the coach says, we're good to go, you know exactly your mission. <laughs> I, just, I just hope it doesn't annoy any jealous teammates who struggle to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to yeah. get to sleep on a plane. That's, They're that insomnia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I wanted to ask about one of your teammates, the, the man who helped you to that win on the opening day, of course, Suleiman Kurpic, who scored that that goal in, in the 1-0 win. A lot of the commentary wasn't just about the goal that he scored, but about the uh, the tattoo, the, the barcode <laughs> tattoo that he has, I think, on on the back of his neck. Are you, are you familiar with that tattoo? Do you know what it leads to? Does it scan? That's a good question. Um, that's, that's a great question, and I'd love to know the answer to that as well. Actually. <laughs> so you're you're in the um, dark as, as yeah, much as yeah, we are. I see. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, very interesting guy, and he's awesome to have around the boys. But I'll have to ask him what, it, what exactly oh. the barcode. Uh, for. Just just don't tell him that we inspired you to, <laughs> to ask the questions. We don't want him chasing us. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll make, I'll make sure. Uh, tell me, uh, your father um, did d- dad play football? Um, yeah, he, he played a bit growing up, just uh, locally. He played for Manly United and Spirit FC, and yeah, he also he worked at Fox Sports as a as a sports um, journo. So, so it's in your cute. blood, huh? It's in your blood. What position did Dad play? Yeah, uh, same as me. Ah, uh, now yeah, it makes now sense. It all comes yeah, out, that, that, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, he gave you the ball with the follow <laughs> follow Dad's footsteps. Uh, Callum, it's uh, it's always good finding out a, a, a little bit more uh, or getting behind a player and getting a sense of what makes them tick. It's it's one of the wonderful things that uh, Channel 10 is looking to do with its new series. Uh, uh, they're calling it All Access. Uh, it's A-League. All Access, yeah. A- A-League All Access. Uh, yeah. Have you seen any of the cameras wandering around and do you know what's coming up? Um, a, a little bit. Same here and there. I mean, yeah, it's such a good thing, and I've I've seen yeah the first couple of episodes of the Sydney FC recently, 
um, released. Um, so and yeah, that's been really cool. I think it's it's awesome for fans and um, obviously yeah, supporters to watch and really see what goes on behind the scenes. When, when did they start filming the think. Sydney one? Had you left by then, or were you still part of the uh, the Sydney FC uh, team? Yeah, I was still I was still in the team for that season. I was yeah, I was played a part in a couple of the early Ooh. games, and then I was sort of yeah, right. That's I was uh, injured for the. Um, most of the season, but it was probably a good season to miss out on. Just before we go and wrap this up, and, and we've really appreciated very much getting an insight, uh, can you tell me how hard it was mentally uh, with a rehab? Because one thing we don't we don't talk about enough is the, the challenges off the field. Uh, so many people play sport in this country, so many people get injured, uh, but they don't have access to the best uh, sports medicine and they don't have the sports physios helping them get back. How, how hard was it for you and how, and how much easier has it been having a professional program and having people there with you almost every step of the way? Mm. Yeah, it was, it was so difficult because that was my, yeah, this is like my first big injuries ever and to be out for, you know, a number of months that really, the time, the time goes super slow and it's such a challenge mentally, like, um, you know, trying to keep up your motivation and come into training every day like the other boys, even though you're not going to be training with them, you're going to be doing your own thing, doing your own rehab and the physios every day. I mean, obviously, yeah, it's so helpful and good to have such good physios around you all the time but at the same time it's such a challenge seeing the boys go go up to train each day and you can't join them so yeah that was a really big challenge for me obviously during those months but I guess at the end of the day it just makes it all worth it now and I can appreciate um yeah obviously how lucky I am to be back playing now and fit well, it's the Western Sydney Wanderers up against the Melbourne Victory at Amy Park, and it's Saturday night, isn't it, uh, Lockie? It is. It is. I'll be there. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that Callum is going to be there as well. It'll be a shock if he yeah. wasn't. <laughs> I hope so. Lockie does this every now and then. He just decides to, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be there. And then he asks the, uh, the most logical question and goes, I hope Callum's there. No, I'm, I'm looking... I don't know about you, Callum, but I'm looking forward to it. It should be a great game, I'm sure, having, you know, grown up through the A-Leagues. This used to be, like, a, a massive fixture. Huge. It was, you know, the two sort of biggest active supporter bases, and I hear that the the numbers for it are, are quite good. So you should be looking forward to, to quite a nice yeah. atmosphere down at Amy Park. Yeah. I'm What's really the, looking forward to it. I think the, the sold-out tickets for the away section. So. Uh, what What's the biggest crowd you've played in front of? Oh, probably, I'm not sure exactly. We would have been sometime in my first season, probably 10, 15,000 or so. So I reckon this weekend, hopefully, it should um, be on your record attendance to play in front of. Well, Lockie and I can tell probably you that, well. Lockie and I can confirm for you, um, it, when there's 20 plus thousand, when there's 30,000 at Amy, it's like... Um, it resonates and pulsates like you wouldn't believe. And the Victory Boys, of course, um, are, are going to have some competition because I understand that um, there are some Western Sydney Wanderers already on the way down. So you will not be alone. Yeah. You will not be alone. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I think, yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be such an awesome match. I think the game will be really good and obviously the crowd should be insane. Melbourne's first home game of the season, first time Nanny can play in front of home crowds that should bring spectators down and yeah as i said the way section sold out so the show sure rbb would down be down there in numbers so callum's definitely been thinking about it hasn't he he's <laughs> just got a it sorted bit. just as much uh, callum thank you very much for joining us on fnr state of our football nation uh to the team and also to the uh, people um, behind the squad at the club who are doing so much good work uh, making sure you guys are presented in the best possible light. Would you thank them? I'm, I'm talking about Jessica and co for making this interview uh, happen and uh, wish you all the very best for the rest of the season and thank you for uh, joining us and giving us a good half hour of um, some insight into what makes Callum Neuenhoff uh, different to so many of the others out there on the football pitch. Yeah, no worries, guys. Thanks, thanks, guys, and thanks for having me on. Pleasure. One of the young guns, uh, a central midfielder who loves that extra work, loves to run around with the ball, and um, you can tell he also enjoys 
scoring. Yeah, well, that I mean, that rocket, he scores good goals. Yes, that, absolutely. That is a memorable one. You've, I'd forgotten that he he was the uh, the originator of that moment of excitement at the ground. I'd forgotten he scored no, that it, goal. It, uh, like I said, it sticks out in in my mind. There there are a lot of people who just mentioned that goal to me in passing. I was like, oh yeah, that that goal. But yeah, no, it's a, a supremely talented uh, midfielder. I hope that he gets a, a more consistent run of games because I think he's he is up to the the level of being a a starting A-League midfielder in, in my mind. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing that fascinates me about so many elements in the game um, is is coming back from injury and to hear him understand uh, how, how difficult it's been. And, uh, and now that he's finally through the hardest part of recovery... He's looking forward to playing as many minutes as possible and we wish him all the very best. Uh, We're going to take a short break. We will. When we come back, another guest, someone who I know is a uh, football uh, sportscaster. He's been a reporter. Um, He's also done some documentary work and I believe these days he's even going to write a book or he might have written a book. Find out more about Michael Caine who will be joining us on FNR in just a moment. Ever wanted a career in football? At the Global Institute of Sport, you can now study a master's degree in football business or football coaching and analysis right here in Australia. GIS is the largest provider of sports degrees in the UK with campuses at Wembley and Etihad Stadium. Learn online with unique access to the iconic MCG and a big hitting Australian industry network. Be one of the first Australians to get a football master's degree and join GIS's global network of football leaders. Apply now to start in February 2023. Learn more at gis.sport.fnr. That's gis.sport.fnr. Ever wanted a career in football? At the Global Institute of Sport, you can now study a master's degree in football business or football coaching and analysis right here in Australia. GIS is the largest provider of sports degrees in the UK with campuses at Wembley and Etihad Stadium. Learn online with unique access to the iconic MCG and a big hitting Australian industry network. Be one of the first Australians to get a football master's degree and join GIS's global network of football leaders. Apply now to start in February 2023. Learn more at gis.sport.fnr. That's gis.sport.fnr. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR. And the program proudly brought to you by GIS Global Institute of Sport that uh, I'm finding out more and more about each and every hour that I'm spent with Lockie Flanagan, who knows a whole lot more about it than I do. GIS. Are you going to, you're going to take their master's degree, master's and analysis? Well, as I said to you at the start of the program, George, I, I genuinely am considering it. I mean, wow. the, the fact that they're, you know, very kind supporters of this I, station I know helps. I know you're like a sponge, so it will not take <laughs> too to much. No, it'll take next to nothing for you to uh, get your way through this course. Well, I mean, use of football coaching and analysis is yeah, th- you, that interests me. I'm, yeah, but you, I see, I fancy look, myself listen, as someone who dine, understands the I game, reckon, but to actually study I reckon it is a you thing. dine on football, so breakfast, lunch and dinner. This is going to be a walk in the park. Well, I'll, I'll have to have to queue up at GIS then. Okay. That's for sure. No GIS worries at all. Dot uh, sport. S- speaking of uh, lining up, we've got uh, another guest, and it's someone who was listening to us last week talking to Daniel McBreen. And, yes. And and he got on the phone to me. He said, "Mate, did you know?" I said, "No." So let's introduce him, and he can pick up the story. Uh, his name is Michael Kane, ex Channel Ten. Or are you still at Channel Ten? No. No. <laughs> Short and sweet. No, no, X, X Channel 10. Um, he's a documentary maker, of course, did that fabulous piece uh, on a guy called Mark Viduka. You know about Mark Viduka, don't you, Lockie? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Rings a bell. Just, Rings just a bell. about one of the finest uh, exports <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, to ever grace a football field in this country. And, and little did I know when we interviewed Daniel McBreen last week that... We were doing it 
in a studio that had the famous shirt of the Adamstown Football Club. Um, and guess who saw it via uh, Zoom? But Michael Kane. Michael, tell us, tell us, pick up the story. Come on. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, yes, you had the, uh, the the famous red and green, the, the green shirt with the red sash in the background, and straight away, I'm a, you know, I went, "Wow, that's that's an Adamstown Rosebud strip." I think it was the, their 130th anniversary shirt. Correct, um, it is correct. Wait, and, and I think it's a bit you need to update the thing. I think they're about 134 years old now. <laughs> 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 but it's the uh, 11th oldest club in Australia. But um, I just, it just occurred to me that Daniel McBreen played, I think it was his first senior season in Newcastle in the Adamstown Rosebud Strip. And, um, and I thought, wow, you know. And, and uh, I, I think they made the grand final that year, but got hammered 6 0, um, I think, by Edgeworth, if it, um, my memory serves me correctly. So it wasn't a great um, end of the season for, for Daniel. But um, what, a, what a famous club uh, that's had so many great players, uh, you know, Ray Bartz, Cole Curran, Graham Jennings, Robbie Middleby, um, the list goes on uh, in regards to how many greats have, have come from that and spawned from that club. Mate, uh, being a Panhellenic and Sydney Olympic boy, Graham Jennings, when you mention oh. names like that, they just uh, resonate and bring back wonderful memories. Um, and they, they were, and they are to this day, uh, some of the richest memories, uh, you know, that we've experienced in in this country, uh, they were liked, and they and and they may not have been the number one sport in the country, but if you followed them, uh, you, you love them all. Um, you go back and uh, go through those characters again, those names, and each of them has made and left a fantastic impression, haven't they? Absolutely, and I'll give you another Sydney Olympic name um, that you'd be fond of. Go on. Adamstown played Australia in 1989 in their centenary year at Adamstown Oval, beat Frank Rock's men 2-1, by the way, and Marshall Soper had a guest appearance in an Adamstown Rosebud shirt. (laughs) (laughs) If you know that. Uh, Marshall Soper, for those uh, that that don't remember the, the wonderful character Marshall Soper, And when he was scoring goals, and he was doing it like, uh, you know, some people, you know, um, uh, flicking uh, 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 flicking little coins around, when he he was in the mood, he'd swing his arm and you were thinking (laughs) to yourself, what's happening? And it was Marshall lining up the next target. He had a voracious appetite uh, for the game and even greater appetite for scoring goals. And he used to enjoy it. And the crowd, he would lift crowds. Uh, there was no way you were sitting on your hands. Let's just say that. Uh, he, he, was if, very, he was very good at causing this starting riots as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, Lockie and I were talking about uh, some of the new documentaries that we're likely to see on Channel 10, the A-League All Access um, material that I believe is starting tonight at 7.30, yeah. uh, right across the 10 network and uh, on Paramount Plus, you'll see it You'll see it on 10 Play and so on, which is fantastic and 10 Bold throughout the weekend. Uh, if it captures the, 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 all the colour that goes on at each and every club in the country, as Lockie and I touched on, then it'll be spectacular. We just don't want it to be uh, too many soap suds used, you know what I mean? We want warts and all. And that wasn't a Marshall Soper pun or anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, don't, just don't replay the Pratt and Park. <laughs> oh. Listen, uh, I got a fab- fabulous photo uh, the other day. Oh, it was a while back, actually, uh, from Tony Maglis. Uh, Tony Maglis was the goalkeeper for Panhellenic in the, in the days when I was in the lower grades. He was the first choice keeper. And he was a wonderful young man, and uh, he reached out uh, a couple of years ago, and we, we caught up again on Facebook, which is just marvellous. But he has the most terrific uh, lineup of, of old photos, and every time I see them, they're magical. <coughs> Pardon me. Are you there? Yeah. I mean, I've also heard, Michael, that you're... I've seen on your, your Twitter, actually, that you, this is a bit of a non-football question, but there's quite an exciting book on the way as well. I, I, I'm not too familiar with the, the story. I'd be interested to, to hear more about it from you. 
Yes, certainly. Um, it's, it's called Bandits and the Ten Door of Secrets. Now, it's not a football book, but it's uh, it's getting published by Fair Play Publishing, which is uh, Benita Mercedes' um, publishing company, which do a lot of football books. But on this occasion, she's expanding into something a little bit different. And um, this is a, a, a great story of, um, of, of, of migrants that have come out to Australia, an Indian family, um, a couple, Manjit and Kowal, um, Goodrill, who, who came to Australia in the early 1980s and started a, an Indian restaurant in uh, Hots Point, moved to Balmain a little bit later. Uh, they've got two boys that have now grown up and they're very much an integral part of the business. And to see, uh, you know, a, a family, it's a real rags to riches sort of thing where, you know, they, 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 they turned up, worked hard, and now they've got a, a real empire on their hands. Um, they, uh, they have a, a, a couple of different venues that, that, um, that cater for weddings. And as we know, an Indian wedding. I mean, there's no, no <laughs> DK. It's like uh, Bolly, Bollywood unleashed. So it's, it's, it's usually quite spectacular, and and there's some of the demands that um, some of the, the brides and grooms you know, put on this family on what they have to do. You know, like um, bringing down a, bringing a, a, an elephant down Lime Street in the middle of Sydney. You know, you know cutting off traffic just for a, a groom to arrive at a, at a ceremony. Um, things like that are, are in the book, and just I suppose so many different great stories of of how they they run their business, sort of like the, the Kardashians of, of <laughs> the Indian culinary scene. They fight like cat and dog, a lot of them, um, but they somehow make it work, which is which is beautiful. Look, the uh, the the game of football in this country, the game of soccer in this country, has been littered and filled with great migrant stories from the very very beginning. Uh, and as each new wave of migrant came into Australia, so too have their stories enriched our game. And, of course, the latest one is the, the Quoll family, mm. the Garen Quoll, who is suddenly on everybody's um, radar. And we've just found out, of course, over the last couple of weeks that he's off to Newcastle United in the English EPL. And we're going to find out now, will he play... Uh, for the club straight out, or will he be loaned out to another European club? Now, you did some travelling in Europe uh, in your uh, attempts to cover some of those docos, especially the one with uh, Mark Viduka. Uh, football over there is is big business, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. Um, I mean, look, um, I went to a Zagreb, you know, um, I did him as a big game um, against Split, uh, the big derby, um, the, the day before I interviewed Mark Viduka, and just the atmosphere. Um, uh, you know, where we can't we ta- can't take um, uh, any type of pyrotechnics in, into uh, an Australian <laughs> football game. <laughs> but let me tell you, it was almost like it was mandatory in that that stadium that night, and it was all, it was quite funny how the um, the game actually got halted for about twenty minutes. It's almost like because when they started up. So even the authorities, the police, was almost like, like, okay, throw them out in the field, get it out of your system. They picked them all up, and then the game went on. No one got ejected. <laughs> what? what why, why is there such a disparity between Europe and Australia? What, what have we done uh, either right or wrong um, to, to create that sort of um, uh, difference in the game is it is it our occupational health and safety uh, set up that that basically stops us from doing anything that vaguely or remotely resembles uh, endangering anybody? I, I think look OH OH and S does, does um, feature in it, but I think you know look uh, we there's so many different football codes in Australia. You know, there's four different football codes, which yep. is very, how many other countries mm. have got that? No, um, and so you know. In Europe, I mean, football's the number one sport, and all over the world, it's the, it's the number one sport. So obviously, here it's, it's a bit different, and and I, I don't think people get that. I don't think they get the culture of football, and that's the problem: is to try and con, you know convert people. But um, people, when they see flares, it's like, oh well, they must be hooligans, you know? Well, no, they're not, you know. I, I, there was a story where um, I was doing a, a live cross to Channel Ten, and I can say this now because I don't work for Channel Ten anymore. <laughs> But the live cross uh, at the front of the Sydney, the old Sydney football stadium before a grand final. Um, and uh, there was, uh, I think it was the, the Melbourne Victory were playing and there was a, a flare thrown. There was a march towards the ground in regards to, you know, the t- turning up, you know, chanting and yep. you know, celebrating the fact they're in a grand final. And um, I was about, to, about two minutes from going live um, for this grand final. 
And the producer got in my ear and he said, you've, you've got to report that there's been a flare being thrown. And I said, well, so what? Well, it's a, it's a flare. And I said, but was it thrown in anger? Was it thrown, well, they're all celebrating here. You know, it doesn't matter. They, but they had a flare. And I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not and, I, and I went against this producer's wishes and I didn't. And I got, my, I got you know. Reprimanded. <laughs> you know what, torn out of me. But, but I didn't care because, again, I wasn't going to report something that wasn't true and all because of a, a you know someone was carrying a flare and that's the thing it's the mentality is that all of a sudden as soon as a flare you know it's always it's front page news it's on the first thing uh, on, on on a news bulletin um whenever there's, a, there's, a, there's something to do with soccer um but i mean look at look at earlier in the year uh, there was that magic was it that magic round in uh, in brisbane with the um that, that brawl that happened in the that rugby league tournament um up there I still don't know what's what's eventuated from that. No, they, no one's up on that. That Nothing. was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, we, we have, uh, I can remember in my days at Channel 9 when we, we'd cover the, uh, the cricket uh, and uh, there would be more than one or two hundred uh, evictions each and every 50 over game, right? Um, and the other day we had eight evictions from the um, Combank Stadium for the Australia Cup game. And yes, some of the things that occurred should not have occurred, and and we need to, you know, and, and we seriously need to uh, educate as many people as possible. But um, you know, no one mentioned any of those evictions in the days at uh, at Channel Nine. And in fact, the other networks also stayed away from it as if it was, uh, you know, ground not to cover. Mm. Mm. So yeah, look, I think that, that's that's the thing too is that there's a lot of. These other sports, uh, they are. They've always been frightened of, of football, and it did rise for a fair bit there. And it's, it's sadly, it's gone back. You know, we've, I think we've gone back in our shell a little bit. You know, we everyone was calling it football again. Now it's like, is it football? Is it soccer? Well, mm. make up our mind. It's, it's, it's football. <laughs> it was always football. Um, and little things like that, uh, having an identity. Um, you know, and uh, uh, we're easy to to have pot shots thrown at us. It's so incidents that have happened the last few weeks makes it quite easy for that to happen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's where we need strong administrators to be strong to, to stamp that sort of stuff out. Look, the an administration has uh, taken uh, a, a very strong stance. Uh, we saw a couple of people uh, now we have, we know they've been identified and, of course, will not uh, see the um, the opportunity to support their club. They're, they'll be banned for their uh, for the foreseeable future. And I believe that the club has also uh, got to show cause. So they've got to uh, take stock of what transpired and see what they come up with and explain the uh, the actions uh, of that weekend. But we, we move on. Uh, I want to find out a bit more about... What's turned you into an author? What what possessed you to go from documentary maker to reporter originally? But uh, I suppose you're always in the story game, aren't you? You're, you're still always telling stories. So this is another another platform, is it? Is, this, is that how how did it come about? Look, a few years ago, um, a friend of mine, Peter Fitzsimons, who you know, is probably one of the most well-known authors in Australia and best. Um, he said to me once, and I, I actually do his voice, and he, said, he said, Michael, the world will take you more seriously if you write a book. <laughs> and I thought, I didn't know what he meant by that. but I, And I thought, wow, well, yeah, I, I never thought of that. But it just come about. The, the, look, the, the, the man just um, did a live cross for Studio 10 while I was working at Channel 10, and um, the cameraman came back. He was all excited because he knew that I liked all you know, quirky, zany stories. Colour and, said, and movement. Colour and movement. This, <laughs> this, he said, look, this family is batshit crazy and, you you know, you need to do a documentary or do something on this. And I, and I went, oh, OK. And, and by the way, their ancestors invented buttered chicken. And I went, wow, that's that's impressive. Thank um, you. When I, looked into it, <laughs> when I looked into it, SBS had already beaten me to the punch regarding the documentary. They did a, 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 a one one part series or it was supposed to be a four part series that turned into one called Turban Legend uh, <laughs> on the, so, it's, uh, which so, was so on it's already there. seen the light of day has it but, but they but they but they weren't happy with it because again it was, it was if it was a four part series that would have got a lot of it out but as you know when it comes to you know just mashing stuff together in one one show it, it doesn't get everything across so they weren't really happy so I said well, why don't I write a book about you guys and we can 
tell it all? And they said, absolutely. And um, and that's where it sort of came from. And then they sort of came to us and said, why don't we make it a cookbook as well? And I went, what? <laughs> I said, yeah. but, but you know what? I actually thought it's something different. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful book, in, you know, in the story about their life and, and how they, even with some of the stories of how they combated um, COVID, you know, at a time when lots of restaurants and cafes were you know, shut off. You know, they thought that they were entrepreneurial the way they looked outside the square and, and said, look, we're, we're, not, we're not going to stop here. And they, they value their, their employees highly. They, they redeploy them doing something different. And they actually started um, a, a food chain which goes into IGAs now, the seal packs, um, where you can go and buy a butter chicken for $15 and heat it up. Um, and this was a, a different part of their, their, their business. And now, incredibly, since COVID this part of the business is actually more successful than their restaurants. Wow. And, and it, so out of, you know, I suppose in COVID, they actually made something and they made something that's successful while others, I suppose, you know, read and, you know, read and hide. You know, how long, how long has the book been in the, uh, in the telling? How long did it take you to, uh, from the idea to, the, you know, the genesis to final edition? Well, it's it's been a little bit over eighteen months now because the problem was was that well, I started writing it and the, a little problem the um, that Matilda's um, <laughs> women's uh, scandal sort of got in the way. The, uh, the um, so I had to do that <laughs> in, in between writing the book, um, which actually was nominated for a, a Walkley Award and unfortunately didn't get the uh, didn't get uh, the. the as a finalist, which was announced today, so good luck to those three finalists. But um, it was nominated by News Limited, um, so it sort of it sort of put paid to writing the book for a little while. Um, but it's, I suppose, you know, it's so much information in regards to speaking to every one of the family. It's not just talking to one person; you're talking to five different people. Um, and it, it, I suppose in working out what the the, the key points are. Mm. The big thing here is that the, the the racism that they encountered when they first came to Australia, and um, it's, 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 we talk about people that are so, I suppose, petulant these days. You know, everyone's offended these days. Um, as you probably know, George, you know, back in the, the schoolyard, being, being called a wog, you know, um, oh, yeah. back in the days, you had to be hard. You, you either hardened up, you know, and, and it probably made you as a you know as the person you are today, just like it did with these this family. That they had to. You know, put up with it, but they didn't stop what they were doing. They didn't lose their focus. And um, where these days it's almost like you, know, you, you can't say anything without offending people. Um, these people are a real, a real shining light. Um, you know, deep. You know, the eldest son went to school. His first day of school, which is in the book. You know, uh, five-year-old going into the school class with a turban on, and. The, the, the ridicule that he caught from you know, from other kids, and he didn't realise why. why. Why hasn't all the other kids got turbans on? Yeah, a fight doesn't know that sort of stuff. So he copped it right from the very start, and again, it, it galvanised him to the man he is today, and he's a, a very good businessman. That's fantastic. Um, what's the name of the book again? It's Mangets and the Tandor of Secrets. Mangets and the Tandor Secrets. All right, well, you know, they say Christmas is fast approaching and um, one of the best things you can do is buy a book, but this makes it even more compelling because it's actually, it also doubles up as a cookbook. Well, I, so you get, well, two, you, you get two, two for the price of one. Well, I think you could even, it, you actually call it a football book and I'll tell you, this is why I'm going to segue this in. Is yeah, that, go you know, on. When you're waiting for your favourite A-League team to start, you, yep. you, you take book into the ground and you, and or, or maybe you're waiting for your favourite Premier League club to, to, to play overnight and you're getting a bit sleepy, read the book. Or even if you're going to Qatar, you know, and, you know, you've, you've missed your flight or it's, you know, you, you, it's a connecting flight, you know, just open it up and it's a good read. So feeling famished, 2 o'clock in the morning, waiting for Australia to play in Qatar, <laughs> you decide you're going to make yourself a buttered chicken. That's it. You got I it. had to somehow make this a football <laughs> book for this for this. Uh, <laughs> Michael Kane, thank you for joining us and for giving us uh, some background on something exciting and yet another chapter in your media life. You've gone from uh, the days uh, on the side of the field there reporting on the local stories that were making a difference uh, for the 10 Network. Then, of course, uh, documentary maker travelling uh, Europe and uh, doing some wonderful pieces on Mark Viduka. And uh, now a book about the Mangets. 
and their, what's it called, Manjits? The Tander of Secrets. The Tander of Secrets. Okay, got it. Thank you, Michael. Well yeah. done. Bravo, mate. Thank you, guys. Have All the best. Day. There you Bye. go. Character and a half. And uh, there's a book launch, um, and he might be uh, onto something. A book, a cookbook, and a great little vehicle just before the World Cup. What are you thinking? It's versatile. Do you cook at home or not? I mean, not... Mm, define cook, you know? I mean, well, would you sit down and uh, and make yourself something in the kitchen oh, absolutely. to have dinner? Would I say that I am a Michelin chef? No. No. Well, come on. Can I feed myself without paying someone else to make the food for me? Yes. Well, more importantly, c- can you feed yourself without ending up in hospital with food poisoning? Most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Uh, Lockie Flanagan, once again, we have survived another hour of football stories on FNR. State of our football nation will be back next week. Yeah. Uh, what's your next adventure? Oh, that's a good question, George. I mean, the one, the adventure that I'm looking most forward to, and I say adventure is because it is, it is a, te- well, specific part of the weekend, it is, because it is a 10 minute walk from my house. It, genuinely West, Western Sydney against Melbourne victory. I, again, I've, we touched on it a few different times with Callum, but I, I think back to my time watching the A-League growing up, and I was very lucky in the sense that I caught, I kind of caught the peak of the A-League when I was in my teens, and it was kind of around the time that I really... Was Popovich f- just arrived at uh, Western yeah, Sydney? Yeah, I, mean I mean, Western Sydney had just arrived as right. a club. I was 12, 13. So and those heaving fans, those great scenes of fans yeah. at the old Parramatta Stadium yeah, going not, nuts. And not only at Parramatta, but against victory. Like, like I said, this was a oh, game games. that yeah. was... The, probably the two best active supporter groups in the country going at Bar it. None. And Western Sydney Bar would none. travel down in numbers. that make a great noise. I'll tell you this, George. I was actually in the RBB once. No. I was. I was. And did I you? I was in the RBB. And you behaved, of course. I behaved. I did the Poznan. I, I, had wow. a, I had a friend who was a Western Sydney Wanderers supporter at the time. He lived in Victoria but was a, a Western Sydney. And you, didn't, uh, and you didn't offer this up to Callum when we spoke to him? No, well, I try to keep it on the keep it on the down low. It was, but the, the thing is, I was stitched up, George, because I was asked by this friend who was in year eight at the time. Oh, do you want to come to Western Sydney Melbourne Victory? And I thought, oh, that sounds like a great use of my time. <laughs> um, agreed to go. And what they neglected to tell me is that it was in the RBB, and I had no choice. I had no choice. And Look, the worst part was because they didn't tell me. I, I in my foolishness, just decided to wear an inoffensive, you oh know, 12, no. 13 year old boy, just a blue and white striped shirt. No. And the amount of people over my shoulder is like, why is that guy wearing blue? Oh, mate, that's you it, remind it. me, one of my old uh, makeup artists at Channel 10 took me to the MCG. She wanted to introduce me to some of her family. And of course, I said, you book the tickets, I'll, I'll just happily uh, rock along. And like you, I was led down the garden path. They put me in the Collingwood cheer squad area because she's a huge Collingwood yeah. fan with all the family. <sighs> and, I'm a ca- the and it's Collingwood Carlton and I'm the lone Carlton person in the Collingwood cheer squad. Well, anyway, all of that is to say it's it's been a long time, I think, since that game has had the energy that it does around it this week. There have actually been some quite sorry crowds when these two teams have sure, played one another. Sure. But this weekend, I still think Victory go in is, is, is the favourites. I think oh, they'll yeah, win absolutely. pretty... I expect them to win fairly comfortably. But I do think... I think the away bay is close to sold out. I think the entire North Terrace is already sold out. It should be a good crowd in the house and uh, hopefully a, a reminder of what, what the A-League can Look, be. you're absolutely right because what we saw last week in the opening round... Uh, we saw a, a, a pulsating game uh, between Sydney FC at their brand new stadium and Victory, and we saw the, one of the most glorious passes, or two of the most glorious passes you're going to see all season. In succession, yeah. In succession, and one by Nani, uh, I just sat there and went, oh, it's, this is, if you're a goalkeeper, there's only one thing you can do. You can't dive across your goal. You've got to actually dive, do the hardest thing possible. You've got to dive yeah. into their feet. And not many keepers do that because technically it's a dangerous ploy. Yes. But it would have been the only way to stop the pass yeah. and from speaking reaching of, its target. Speaking of Nani, George, we should head off because we've got to go buy popcorn. We've got to get the home studio go set up for, for A-Legs All Access. Catch you then. <laughs> 
You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR.